Lord, I thank you for your blessings and your love. And, and again, thank you for your word. Your word is a well that just has no bottom. It is so deep. And the water is so good, Lord. It is living water. And, and it reveals you because you are the word of God. And it's, uh, every word is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And um, so we know that your word is life to us. So today, again, Lord, we agree with your word. We agree with you and your purposes today as we, as we look at the word. May you, may you speak and reveal to each one of us, again, individually, wherever we are in our relationship with you, and also corporately as a body of Christ, as a lampstand. And uh, we, we give you praise for what you'll do and how you'll speak. And uh, Jesus, we pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Um, we're doing angels. This is Kevin's Revenge, is what I should have called this. Angels, Kevin's Revenge. Because Kevin is Kevin Michael, and after all that stuff I did with, you know, the book of Daniel and stuff, why well, Kevin is getting his just rewards today with Angels Michael. Um, yeah, I just want to look at it a second. Obviously, you see the dragon there. And that's where we're going to end up in Revelation with Michael and the, and the dragon. I like that. So um, our anchor scripture, which is on the way to Revelation after a couple of stops, it says uh, Jude chapter 1, verse 9. Well, Jude, verse 9. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you, which is a really interesting little, it's just a little blurb there. There's a couple of things that happen in this verse. Um, one is, I, I mentioned last week that we think of Gabriel as an archangel, but it never says anywhere that Gabriel is an archangel. That doesn't mean he's not. It just doesn't say it in Scripture. The one person that it does say is an archangel is Michael. It says clearly the archangel Michael here. And so um, so just, again, as we go through some of these things about angels, there'll be things that we've known all our lives, and there'll be some things we've known all our lives about angels that we will not find in Scripture. So we will have to adjust. It doesn't mean that it's not necessarily true. It just means we can't say it authoritatively because it's not in Scripture. So, um, here we go. Uh, this, this first part is review. Are you ready? I'm going to revisit Gabriel momentarily. Um, last week, and it's, it's to point out a few things, last week we started with Gabriel. The most famous angels are Gabriel and Michael. And we started with Gabriel. And uh, in Daniel 8, Gabriel showed up to Daniel, and he looked like a man, okay? So he looked like a man. His name means warrior of God, man of God, or strong man of God. His mission, he said very clearly what his mission was. His mission was to tell Daniel the, the vision that Daniel was having. He was to tell Daniel the meaning, interpret it for him. When when. Gabriel, in this instance, and I describe this as a, as a dimmer switch because it's just such a good way to, to think of it. But in this particular thing, the first time that Daniel, because Daniel has at least two encounters with Gabriel, this first time that he meets Gabriel, as Gabriel walks closer to him, Daniel just becomes undone. So as, as Gabriel gets closer Daniel is overtaken by a sudden terror. He falls face down to the ground. It says he's astounded, and as you go into the, the wording and everything, he goes into a deep sleep or he becomes unconscious. Uh, and then Gabriel touches him, which evidently strengthens and energizes him, and Gabriel stands him back up so that Daniel has the strength to stand in Gabriel's presence. 
And uh, he then basically interprets everything for Daniel. And then after Gabriel's gone, uh, it says that Daniel for several days was, was sick and grieved and exhausted. And uh, eventually he went back around to doing the king's business. And he, when he considered the vision, he was astonished and appalled because it was beyond discernment and understanding. And this, this gives an illustration of several things. One, one is that uh, we said that typically when you see angels in Scripture, one of the things you see angels doing is bringing a message or giving an interpretation. And obviously Gabriel does that. Every time it says Gabriel, he's bringing a message or giving an interpretation. Uh, also, one of the things we said is sometimes angels sort of fade into the background because what really takes over in the moment is whatever the revelation is. Daniel, even though he had those manifestations in Gabriel's presence, he's undone several days after because of the revelation. Not because of Gabriel, but because of the message, because of the revelation, because of the vision that God gave him. And he didn't understand. He was having a hard time discerning and all of that kind of thing appalled. Again, it doesn't say at Gabriel or his encounter with Gabriel, but about the vision and the revelation of the vision. So that, that's an illustration. Then in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel has taken on the sins of the people. He recognizes that Israel is going to be in captivity for 70 years and that it's close to the end of the 70 years. And in fact, Daniel is confessing the sin of Israel as if it's his own sin. And he's making request of God for Jerusalem and the holy hill where the temple is built. And while he's still in prayer, so before he gets to the amen, Gabriel comes in swift flight. In this particular instance, there's no uh, re record of him becoming undone. You know, so the dimmer switch is at a different place when Gabriel shows up this time. So... Uh, it's about the time of the evening sacrifice, and Gabriel says he came to instruct Daniel and give him insight and understanding, much like in Daniel 8. And then he says to Daniel, the reason I was sent is because God delights in you. God highly esteems you. You are his beloved, and you are precious to him, and that's why he sent me. Isn't that cool? And so consider the word or the revelation, understand the vision, and then he explained it to him. Both of those things that Gabriel came to explain to Daniel were things about what was going to take place with Israel between Daniel's day and the coming of Jesus. So another thing that happens when Gabriel shows up is he's talking about Jesus, about the fulfillment of everything and how it's going to end in Jesus and everything that's going to happen until we get to Jesus. So the dimmer switch is in a different place. It doesn't say anything about Daniel becoming undone or anything like that. Again, I give you the illustration like, like Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Those disciples had been with him all the time. They probably didn't typically fall out unconscious in his presence. But the dimmer switch got turned up on the Mount of Transfiguration and Peter, James, and John, the closest humans to Jesus, hit the deck face down, and they were out. They were undone because he turned the dimmer switch up, the glory up. So, so different encounter with Gabriel here for Daniel, different place for the, the dimmer switch. Then after everything that he has said to Daniel comes true, Gabriel shows up with Zechariah in Luke chapter 1. Zechariah is serving at the altar of incense in the temple. Uh, Gabriel shows up again. Angel in both Hebrew and Greek means messenger or envoy. So he appears, he's standing at the right side of the altar of incense, which represents the prayers of the people, and is right at the, uh, the veil between the holy place and the most holy place. It says here, so Zechariah has a physical reaction that Zechariah is startled, and if you look at the Greek, it's agitated or has an inner commotion. I would have an inner commotion if Gabriel was standing right here too. 
So there's an inner commotion. He's gripped or seized, it says, with fear, and that fear is terror, dread, alarm, when you look at the Greek. And Gabriel identifies himself because Zacharias says a few interesting things. And so Gabriel has to give his credentials. He says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And he was sent to speak and tell Zechariah the good news. The good news of which was the prayer that you stopped praying is about to be fulfilled. That's pretty good news. So uh, he goes on and tells Zechariah that he's going to be silent and unable to speak until the day that his words come true because of the doubt that Zechariah was speaking. And so that's an important lesson for us to learn to agree with God and not speak because evidently, Gabriel is saying, if I let you keep speaking that doubt, you can waylay the plan of God in your own destiny. So I'm going to shut you up so you can't say things. And that's another thing. When you say, I thought it, I might as well say it. No, 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 no. When you think something there's the possibility of something being conceived, and when you speak it, you birthed it out. When you don't speak it, that thought is never born. Stop it in your mind. Don't speak it out. Because when you speak things, you're being like God, and you're speaking things into existence because we're made in the image of God. Okay? So stop it up here. So it goes on to say that he did this because Zechariah didn't believe his words, but his words would come true because Gabriel was in alignment with God and God had said it, right? So, so again, he said amazing things to Daniel about who Daniel was, shows up with Zechariah, and to me that's amazing because he says, I'm bringing you the good news that the prayer that you stopped praying is going to be fulfilled. That's, that's cool. And then later in Luke 1, in the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, which means Zechariah went home and acted on faith instead of doubt, right? Somehow Elizabeth got pregnant. He must have done something in faith. So God sent Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Her name was Mary. Both were descendants of David. He said, greetings, you are highly favored. And she was like, what? Who is this guy? Again, the dimmer switch must have been different. She did, it doesn't say that she fell out or anything, but she's trying to process what he's saying. You who are highly favored, that means endued with special honor, encompassed with favor, pursued with grace. Isn't that cool? Pursued with grace. Honored with blessings. All of that, highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled. This is the only thing it says about her reaction besides trying to process what's being said. And this in Greek, this word greatly troubled in Greek is disturbed or agitated, again, an inner commotion, or perplexed in considering what he's saying. And she wondered what kind of greeting this was or what it might be. Uh, again, angels... As you look through the word, they are heavenly messengers or envoys from God. They're usually delivering messages or they're carrying out God's will in some way. They're praising or worshiping God or they're guarding the throne of God, positioned at the throne of God, or they're a part of the host or the army of God. So um, I'll just leave that there for the moment because now we're going to transition to Michael. One of the things with Michael that you'll notice as we go through these scriptures today is there is no, now again, it doesn't mean it never happens, just like it doesn't mean what we've looked at is the only time that uh, Gabriel appeared, because Gabriel may have been the angel in many of the angel stories. There are angel stories from Genesis to Revelation. Gabriel may have been in many of those, but he's not named. So we only looked at the ones where it says definitely it was Gabriel. Michael may be in lots of angel stories, but he's not named. He's named in these that we're looking at today. 
In these that we look at today, Michael has no human interaction. He does not interact with people. Gabriel came specifically to interact twice with Daniel, once with Zechariah, and once with Mary. So four times we know of, for sure, Gabriel came, had messages for these people sent directly by God. Michael shows up. He has no human interaction. There's no record of him, of him being with somebody or talking to anybody. Michael always shows up in warfare in the heavenlies. Gabriel brings good news, messages. The messages are always centered. There's the messages before Jesus saying Jesus is coming, and they're the messages right at the time, the fullness of time when he says, Jesus is here, right? Now Michael engaged in conflict, engaged in warfare, battling, fighting. Nothing on earth. Everything's in the heavenlies. Okay? You get a feel for the difference? This means yes. Yes. Okay, good, good, good. Some of you were doing it, but you know. Just checking. So here we are. We're going to start with Michael. First of all, um, I don't think I have a... Oh, I do have this slide. Okay, I didn't know if I remembered. So Michael Balafka, can you say your name in Hebrew, please? Mikael. Okay, we're just going to go with that. I may not have gotten all the... <laughs> again, you know. But Mikael. Actually, it looks like Mikael. Or Mikael. I don't know. But uh, who is like God... Uh, in the Hebrew, obviously, an angel who stands in time of conflict for Israel is where he shows up. And then also in the Greek, Michael or Mikael, again, who is like God. And it actually says there he's an archangel in the New Testament. So the archangel who's the guardian angel of the Israelites. And, and because of this with Michael... And some other passages, some people believe that there is an angel that's assigned to each nation. That there is, you know, an angel associated with every nation on earth. And obviously, Michael is associated with Israel. So, so here we go. Daniel 10, 12. So we had that stuff with Gabriel in 8 and Gabriel in 9. And this is an angel that typically people think is Gabriel, but it does not say it's Gabriel. This is the time that Daniel's praying and fasting, and there's been a three-week. Remember, last week, Gabriel showed up before he got to amen. Right? He came swift flight before he got to amen. This time, Daniel's been fasting for three weeks. No answer. No answer. No answer. And an angel shows up, that people assume is Gabriel, but it does not say he's Gabriel anywhere, okay? So this angel is talking to Daniel. He says, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day. So very same thing as with Gabriel. Gabriel said, when you began to pray, I was sent. This angel says, from the first day you prayed, he was sent. Don't ever get upset when God says he's not answering. From the moment you pray, the throne is activated and answers are set. How do things get prolonged? That, that's a whole different sermon. One way things get prolonged is you've got to get to the fullness of time. It took 4,000 years, fullness of time, Jesus was born. People prayed. And people prayed. And the Lord heard those prayers and agreed with those prayers. And in the fullness of time, different seeds have different germination periods. There will be a harvest on the prayers in the fullness of time. You want the timing of God. You don't want something born out of season. Right? So that's one thing. Another thing is Danny can waylay his own destiny. Gabriel says, you're not going to speak anymore because you're speaking against your destiny. So Danny prolongs the answer because Danny doesn't stay in agreement with the prayer. So Danny holds up the answer. 
And then there's warfare because the enemy hates you. He wants to kill you. He does not want to see you step in your destiny. So there's warfare to, to uh, prevent the answer from getting to you. So they're just three quickies, right? But another sermon another day. So since the first day you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, remember he was, he was confessing his sin and the sins of his people. Your words were heard and I've come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. He's saying that he was engaged in heavenly conflict. Satan is not, I know that we often like to put him in, the, in hell with flames and this, this throne made out of skulls and all this kind of stuff, you know, and all that kind of, but he, his kingdom's in the heavenlies. He built his kingdom between you and your answer, you and your source. And he intends to prevent things from taking place and getting back and forth. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So, so uh, he sent, when Daniel begins praying, but he's held up in the heavenlies by evidently, when it says a prince of Persia, evidently, just like Michael is associated with Israel, it's a, it's a principality that's associated with Persia. Now, why would he not want him to get through? Because one of the things that angel's coming to do is tell him how Persia's days are numbered and Greece is coming. Right? Yeah, yeah. Now, there's good things going on in Persia, too, because Cyrus is being raised up. And they're actually angels that are in charge of Cyrus and Darius for the good of Israel. But this one is the, is the prince of Persia that wants to see oppression take place. So he's being held up in the heavenlies by the prince of Persia, the prince of the Persian kingdom. He's being resisted for three weeks. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, so evidently, Again, this is an allusion to him being an archangel. Evidently, we've, we've talked about you get the idea that angels are organized in some kind of military rank system, and this is certainly leading credence to that by calling him one of the chief princes, came to help me, assist him, because I was being detained there with the king of Persia. Now, I've come to explain to you what will happen with your people, to your people in the future for the ver vision, I can't talk, concerns a time yet to come. And then, well, I'm not going to put the next up yet. So what we know right now about Michael, who is who we're focusing on, Michael came to render assistance. And when Michael comes to render assistance, it doesn't say he brought a boatload of angels with him. Michael came. If you're looking for somebody big and bad to help you out, after... Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Michael's a good one to have on your side because apparently there ain't nothing in creation besides the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that can tell Michael what to do. <laughs> right? Is that okay, Mike? Yes, totally good with you so far. Yeah, you're all about it, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so Michael shows up and because Michael shows up, Michael evidently subdues this principality so that then this angel is free to go to Daniel. And Michael is holding this principality so it cannot interfere with the angel's mission to give Daniel revelation, to bring the message to Daniel. Right? Okay. So we're going to skip down further in Daniel 10 because we're staying focused on Michael. So the angel said, do you know why I've come to you? Soon I will return to fight again. So he's going back to the fight. This angel is saying, I've got to return to the fight that I was in that held me up in coming to you. I've got to go back and fight again. I'll return to the fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. 
But first, I'll tell you what's written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. So your prince, he's talking to Daniel. So evidently, again, he's saying it's this illusion that Michael is the prince. Remember how it called the prince of Persia? Is evidently the prince of Israel, the prince of the chosen people. And notice, no one's there supporting me against them except Michael. So, uh, well, I won't, I won't go all those places. I'll just go on with it. So he goes on, he's continuing to talk about that through chapter 11. He gets to chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael, the great prince, so here's more information. The great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. So again, there's Michael and the great prince who protects your people or Israel. Okay? Verse 2, it just continues this idea about the judgment thing. Daniel 12, 2, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. So actually, in Daniel, there's a thing about the end. You know, we've got 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Wouldn't have you ignorant. There's going to be a shout. Michael's probably the one who shouts. Since he's the only one listed as an archangel, he's probably the shouter. Because it's probably a battle cry, Right? And then the dead in Christ, right, will be raised in the twinkling of an eye, and those who are alive will follow, right? right. Yes. That, isn't that what it sounds like yes. there? Okay. Thank you for agreeing with me. It's just cool. So all that's in Daniel, and now to Jude. Jude is interesting First of all, Jude, when you go through Jude, Jude's a, obviously a short book, only one chapter. Jude is the brother of Jesus. You know that? In it, he says he's a servant of Jesus, and he says he's the brother of James, which is showing some humility. He's, if he's the brother of James, who's the chief apostle of the church in Jerusalem, who's the brother of Jesus, that means Judah, Jude, is the brother of Jesus. So you can see Jude, you can see Judah, which is the Hebrew name, and you can see Judas, which is the Greek way. So Judas Iscariot, and there's a couple of other uh, apostles named Judas that you'll see. Jude is the same name, Judah in Hebrew, okay? So he's, he's evidently very humble. He, he's like, I'm a servant of Jesus, I'm the brother of James. And he just mentions Michael, in verse 9 and 10. It says, But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do not understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. The main thing, without trying to break anything open, because it's in a context, and I just want to focus on Michael, the main thing that you need to know is the chief warrior of the angelic host, one we're told is the archangel, does not bring a slanderous accusation against even the devil. Yet we go out and speak all kinds of junk about people. We are falling into the enemy's hands. We're agreeing with the enemy. Look at this. It says, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander. So Michael is not daring to condemn the devil, the one who is worthy of being condemned. Michael, the archangel of God, does not dare condemn him. And yet we talk very freely. We have no idea the power of our words, and we better get a cap on it. We're speaking evil. Who's the one that slanders? The devil is the one that slanders. He's a slanderer. The truth is not in him. He's an accuser. 
when we speak evil of people, we're playing right into the devil's hand and we're waylaying our own destiny. We have to learn. We got to get, get some control on this tongue and agree with God. Even if you hate somebody in your heart, you better not say it. Again, you better cap that thing and let it die unborn than to speak it out. Right? Because we're called to bless people. We're called to pray for people. We're called to try to get them into their destiny with Jesus. Think of the things that were spoken over Saul of Tarsus. Do you know that it's possible that Saul of Tarsus could have become Paul the Apostle sooner, but possibly church people were saying bad things about him? So they actually prolonged the persecution. We don't know that for sure. I'm just going on human nature. How about that? I'll go with nature, human nature. But somewhere, somebody was praying for Saul of Tarsus and asking God to do a mighty miracle. They were coming into agreement with God who wanted to use Saul to win the world and write three quarters of the New Testament scripture. So you better be careful because you don't know who you're speaking evil of. You may be speaking evil of someone who will save your children. It changes things. God's perspective is different. Come into alignment and speak the things of God. If Michael did not dare to condemn the devil when he's in warfare, he's in contention. Sometimes we say, well, I just, you know, I just, I lost my head. I was in the moment. Michael didn't lose his head in the moment with the devil himself. And what he said was, the Lord rebuke you. He called on a higher power. Right. Michael has power to deal with the, with, with the devil on his own. Because he's an archangel. He's a warrior. Right? But he didn't, he didn't do that. He said, the Lord rebuke you. He put it in the Lord's hands. And then it goes on talking about the things about slandering and the ways that we speak about all kinds of stuff. But I'm not going to talk about that. Enough said. Let's go to Revelation. So Revelation chapter 12. This is, this is again, so we've seen Michael... Dealing with the prince of Persia. Holding the prince of Persia while the angel gets to Daniel. Angel comes back to that conflict. Michael's going to continue battling for Israel in the midst of changing world powers. Then we've got him contending for the body of Moses with the devil. And now we've got him here. War breaks out in heaven. Revelation 12, 7 and 8. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. So who's the dragon? Seen him before, right? The devil and his angels. And the devil and his angels fought back. But the devil and his angels, not strong enough. Not strong enough. You can have every demon in the universe on your doorstep. One Holy Spirit deals with all of them. One name of Jesus deals with all of them. You don't know how powerful you are. Check this out. Jesus shows up on the shore. A demoniac comes and throws himself at Jesus' feet. He's busted chains. He scares people. Jesus said, what is your name? He says, my name is Legion and we are many. One devil, well, one demon answers Jesus, my name is Legion, and we are many. There was one demon in charge, and evidently a legion was 6,000 Roman troops if it was a full legion. If that was a full legion of demons, that man had 6,000 demons in him 
with one chief that was in charge and the rest were occupying territory. And he still could go to Jesus. He could still go to Jesus and say, I want to get delivered. He had 6,000 demons in him. Stop being afraid of the devil. Amen. He didn't have the Holy Spirit in him. A man made in the image of God who was fallen could handle 6,000 demons and still have enough sense to say, I want to be delivered. Jesus can take care of this for me. Do not be afraid of darkness. There are so many more angels than there are fallen angels. There's so much more power in the heavenlies, and that power is available to assist you. You've got the Spirit of God in you. Remember what Gabriel said to Mary, the Lord is with you. You've got the Spirit of God in you, and if we'll learn to agree with God and not, like, waylay our own destinies, but agree with God, we have so much more authority and power than darkness. So many forces to bring to bear. They are insignificant if we step into where we are. The problem is we won't step into where we are, so they are significant. But if we'd step into where we're supposed to be, they would be insignificant in our lives. And we would start taking territory for other people instead of just trying to hold on to the bottom of the rope with a knot in it ourselves. That's hot. I hope you can feel how hot that is. So they weren't strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. Lost their place. Verse 9. The great dragon was hurled down. Michael watched him hurled. <laughs> the great, so Michael is still up there, right? The great dragon is hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. This one that one day we're going to walk by and we're going to look at him and go, this is who caused all the trouble? This guy? One day we're going to see him for what he really is and we're going to be amazed that he caused us trouble, that he caused the whole world trouble. One day we're going to be in his presence and his lies won't work. His deceptions won't work. His manipulation won't work. His enchantment won't work. And we'll just look at him and go, this is the problem? So he starts off getting that serpent to, to agree with him so he could interact with the woman. And then it goes on to call him the devil, Satan, the one who leads the whole world astray, hurled to earth and the angels with him. Hurled to earth. And do you think God would hurl them to earth and leave us vulnerable. They were hurled to earth because we're more powerful than they are. They were kicked out of heaven. And if we know who we are, they shouldn't be a problem. Man, Adam, was to guard. Guard the garden from what? From these guys. And Adam had everything necessary and I don't know how long he went, but he went a long time victorious in that job. Because I don't think, you know, I have a tendency to think if it was me, seventh day God rested. Early on the eighth day, I screw up. <laughs> you know, that's what I assume. But probably not. Because God really likes these circles and the closed circles. I really think 33 and a half years because Jesus was 33 and a half. I think the fall came 33 and a half years after God rested. And Jesus took care of it when he was 33 and a half. I don't know that for sure. It's just what I think. I think it's a good explanation because the way God likes 
to just close up the loops. So that means man and woman were victorious for whatever period of time. They were victorious over all these fallen angels. No problem. For a long time. So in Revelation 12, 10, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, that makes me think of over at the river, Daniel heard a voice say, this is Gabriel. Gabriel, go talk to him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. And this is the uh, passage that all of us should know. And those brothers and sisters that were accused by this accuser triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So, so let me just say a couple of things. First of all, we know that the blood of Jesus is what turns everything. Right? And we also know for me to embrace the blood of Jesus, for me to be saved, I've got to give up my life and embrace his, right? Sometimes we do a poor job of it, but we know that Danny has to, you know, old things need to go so Danny can be a new creation, right? But there are three components there that show our victory, show how we triumph. The blood of Jesus, which is incorruptible, imperishable, totally, totally does what it's called to do. It saves everybody who calls on Jesus. Everybody willing to give up their lives and take on his life saves them, right? But we can, do, we can be saved and not triumph. Because look, it also requires the word of our testimony, in other words, it means we got to speak like God to triumph over the enemy. So we can be saved. We can have the blood of Jesus. We can give up our lives to embrace his life and never get the revelation of the power of our words. And he will beat us and beat us and beat us till we're tossed to and fro by every wind and wave. We're walking around dizzy and confused. Saved, but dizzy and confused because our victory isn't complete till we learn to talk like Jesus. What does testify mean? It means bear witness. Bear witness to what? Bear witness to Jesus. Look what Gabriel bore witness to. Jesus Because Jesus only did what he saw his father do and only said what he heard his father say. So if I want to be triumphant, how many of you want to triumph? No, I was talking about the car, but you know. Ah, <laughs> uh, that was so lame, but I think it's so funny. So, some people in here don't know there's a car called a Triumph. Isn't there a bike? Isn't there a bike called the Triumph, too? Yeah, you bikers. You, that's what y'all were thinking. Yeah. So. By the way, I just want to say, Dolores, thank you. Dolores gave me a Harley hat that's got Jesus on it. Made in China. It's a really interesting... It's a really interesting juxtaposition of things, you know. And, yeah, from a what? A oh, yeah. It, well, that brings another thing into it. <laughs> yeah, so, so um, I will wear it proudly. Because Jesus is Lord of all. <laughs> it's just so cool. Bikers, China, just the, all of it. <laughs> I don't even know what I was going to say now. 
Anyway, but this is a good place to stop. <laughs> Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure. He's, when, when we notice, notice the way that we become saved, we confess with our mouth that Jesus is the Christ. With our mouth, the power is in the tongue for life and death. We confess that he is Lord. And when we make that confession, we're agreeing with God. It's, it's like he said, to, to agree that what God does in heaven will be done on earth. Which means it's not because we don't agree with it. Because that's what we're supposed to be doing. So we agree that Jesus is Lord, and the first thing he does is he gives us the gift. It becomes Christmas immediately, Christmas, the nativity. He, and he gives us a gift. He gives us the Spirit of God who is just like him and just like the Father inside us. So that now we have the ability to hear what he's saying and see what he's doing and come into agreement with it. And the only one, Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure, the only one that places a measure on the Holy Spirit in Danny is Danny. Because the Holy Spirit is immeasurable. There is no cap. There is no maximum limit. He can fully fill all of us in here right now. It doesn't, it doesn't, it won't make the lights dim. Right? He can fully fill every person on earth right now, and it won't make the lights dim. He's the Holy Spirit. So the one that places the limit on the Holy Spirit in Danny is Danny. So if Danny wants the Holy Spirit without measure, Danny needs to take the measuring stuff off and let him be continuously filling me. You know, a lot of the words about being filled with the Holy Spirit, when you look at them in the Greek, they're a continuous filling. It isn't like, I filled you up to the top, I can't put any more in, and so that's all you ever get. No, it keeps on pouring. You keep on being replenished. So he's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we can triumph over the enemy because he's done the blood of the Lamb and we've made this confession that we were crucified with Christ and so now it's Jesus that lives and we want to be a part of that and now the word of our testimony. Will we testify? Will we bear witness to what Jesus has done for us? what Jesus is doing for us, what Jesus will do for us. Will we be like Gabriel so everything's about Jesus? Praise team can go ahead and come up because I'm, I'm in the short rows, which is good because it's 12.07. So here's this idea. Just for you to consider while we're doing this series, we've seen, we've seen Gabriel and we've seen Michael. Gabriel has come with good news. Guess what? We have good news to share. Yeah. Gabriel has come, and sometimes the dimmer switches up and people get undone. Do you know I've been in situations where people have become undone because the presence of God is happening about me and people around me in such a way that people come undone. Because evidently God turns the dimmer switch up. So the very thing that Gabriel did we're called to do, share the good news, bear witness. That's what Gabriel's doing. And the thing that Michael does, we've been instructed on how to war in the heavenlies, that we're not warring against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers, things in the air. So we've seen Gabriel and we've seen Michael and we have the same responsibilities that they have to pull down evil strongholds, to make a way for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And look, look at how God feels about us while we're doing these things. We're highly esteemed. He sees us as the desire of his heart. He sees us as precious. He sees us as treasure. He wants to answer the prayers I'm not even praying anymore because he's not giving up on the stuff I've given up on on my destiny. He's still all about me. So, blood of the lamb, don't love this life so much and get my word in proper alignment with his words. Everybody saved? Everybody saved? Okay, cool. Does that mean that if you're not, you're saying I'm not? I don't know. I'm, I'm just looking. Let me get under the lights real quick. Everybody good? Because I can see you now. All right. Okay, well, we'll transition to communion then. Let's stand. This is the meal of champions, and you are a champion. You're an overcomer. You're a prevailer. You're a mighty man and woman of valor. So, Lord, thank you. We look on the one who was pierced on our behalf. Lord, thank you for being pierced for us. Lord, it's amazing. You've carried those marks into heaven so that we might not ever forget that you were pierced so we could be with you forever. So, Lord, today, thank you for the cross. It is horrendous for us to consider, but thank you, Lord, for what you did for us at the cross. And thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for this bread and this cup that reminds us of what you've done and pledges, promises that you'll continue to move on our behalf and that you are with us. So meet with us as we eat and drink, Lord, and bring revelation. In Jesus, we pray it. Thank you, Lord. Amen.